people have an inclination to, uh, to want to go buy soil because they don't, they don't think the soil they've got is any good. If there's weeds growing in it and there's worms in it, uh, it's probably halfway as good. It might be a bit of soil. Hey, it's Greg here with MaritimeGardening.com and I'm building another hygge culture bed. And uh, I thought while I was building it, I would uh, sort of explain what I'm doing, uh, talk through the process, and also speak to issues of soil. Uh, I just did a garden very recently called Location Design Soil or something like that. It was advice for new, the new gardener on location design and soil, I think was the title. The thumbnail says Location Design Soil. Um, anyway, uh, in that video, I got on a diatribe about horse manure because I used it in a lot of my garden beds here. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in recent years, um, most of the beds I've built in the garden, I've, I've built using the hygge culture method. That's the idea where you, you know, you have a garden space, you define a garden space, you take the soil out, basically dig a grave, <laughs> fill it up with uh, wood and stuff like that, or rotten logs and, and yard waste and things like that, and then put the soil back on top. So it's, it's basically a compost pile with a garden on top of it that composts very slowly, maybe over 10 years. And while it's composting, it's sucking up water and the, the wood, the rotten wood becomes sponge-like and holds a lot of water. And so it really, you know, for me, <laughs> pretty much eliminates the need to have to water that garden over the, for the majority of the garden season. Uh, so I'm doing that right here. And I've done videos where I've built hygge culture beds before, but uh, since I just did a video where I was talking about soil, I thought while I was building this, uh, I'll explain what I'm doing as I'm doing it, and I'm going to do the whole thing in real time to show you how long it takes um, instead of speeding things up and just talk through it because it's a nice day and it's not too windy and I can actually have the camera going here. So uh, let's get started with no further ado. So I've got a bed here, and uh, I don't know if you can tell, but there's a bit of a grade here, so you know it's basically uphill that way, right? So what I've done is the, um, this side of the bed is sitting right on top of the soil. And this side of the bed, uh, I basically, with a pickaxe, sort of dug it out a little bit. And I got this side maybe three inches, you know. Um, the two by six is only three inches above grade on this side. And it's one, all, all of it's above grade on this side. Now I'm going to add, uh, you know, I have sand, uh, sand pathways in between my garden. So I'm going to buy a bit more sand and I'm going to add some sand all the way around this. So, I mean, the whole thing's going to be sort of... You know, uh, it's going to have sand up to it like this. The whole thing's not going to be sitting on top of the sand. It'll be submerged relative to the, the sandy pathway, but it's going to be sitting on the actual, you know, substrate or whatever you want to call that, the, the base, the foundation or whatever, the actual soil that the sand is sitting on. Uh, so this side is sitting on that soil, and this sand, this side here is sort of dug down a little bit, just, just so I could, it, it's still not level. This bed has got a downhill grade to it, but it's not as steep as the downhill grade that it's sitting in. So I could have brought this side down a little bit more, and I could have brought this, well, this side I was going to leave like this, but I could have brought this side down a little bit more. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be perfectly leveled. The more level you have it, the better, and ideally it should be perfectly level, but um, sometimes you just got to get stuff done, <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, a, a, sl a slight grade isn't really a big problem. And especially, so if, if, you're, if it's a garden where you're going to be sowing seeds all the time and you're worried about water runoff, moving the seeds around, you know, really tiny seeds like lettuce, that, that, that matters to an extent. This is going to be a perennial garden. I'm getting some um, uh, partridge berries, for those that don't know it, what they're called, um, lingon berries is another term for them. I'm getting them from a, a nursery in Ontario called Wiffle Tree Farms. Just giving them to me for free to try them out. Um, so a little shout out to them, a little plug for them. And uh, they're going in this bed right here. So it doesn't really matter that it's a, a bit tilted here because I'm just sticking, uh, you know, they're going to give it to me in a pot or I don't know if it's a pot or a whip or bare root. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to get them. I, I think they're probably going to arrive soon. So, uh, yeah, i got to get this bed ready. And it doesn't really matter that it's got a bit of a tilt to it. But I, I thought, you know, I brought it up a little bit. So it's a little bit level. Uh, so now, basically, uh, I was out here last night with my daughter just doing that sort of leveling exercise and getting the major uh, weeds and rubbish and stuff out of the garden. Yeah. So uh, 
this box here has all the weeds and rubbish and sticks and roots and you know basically everything that's rough that was in this soil everything I could find and if I find anything else I'll throw it in there so I'm gonna dig a trench once I get all the logs out and stuff I'm gonna throw all this stuff on top of the logs uh, and then I'll put maybe some leaves on that and then and then we'll put the soil back in that's, that's the process right so if nothing really goes to waste everything will rot it's possible that some of that root material will uh, find its way up through, but I, I, I sincerely doubt it. Um, so, you can put a tarp uh, next to your garden bed and uh, shovel the soil onto a tarp. You can do that. Um, but uh, I have found that it's, it's better you've got them to put them in containers like this so you know or a wheelbarrow right and the closer the container is to where you're working the better right but uh, yeah now the process is just to dig all that up so in a sense what you're doing right now I mean yes I'm a no-till you can see the frost in that soil I'm a no-till gardener but this is kind of like a one-time Basically anything I find that's not fine, throwing in that. Uh, this is sort of like a one-time tilling. But that's it. It's not like you have to do this <laughs> every year. All right? Once you do a bed like this, if you keep covering it with mulch, um, God, I, I mean, I found the beds that I cover with mulch, I, I've never had to really go back and do anything with them. This is a root from a blackberry, I think. So, I mean, yes, it's a, it's a bit of work to, uh, to do this. And depending on what you're going to plant in it, it can be more or less work. I'm planting perennials here, so I'm not going super deep, and I'm not adding a whole lot. I'm just, I like to have my soil about, the soil level in my garden about halfway up. Like if this is a six inch high box, I like having it about halfway up. That leaves a bit of a lip to hold uh, different mulches in and keep them from blowing around the garden. So right now, the soil in this garden is at grade. And I'm basically gonna throw enough uh, rotten wood and you know weeds and material like that to, uh, to have the effect that when I put this soil back in, it'll, instead of being down at grade down here, it'll be up, right? Three inches from grade that's the idea good god i'm already getting hot in here and uh there goes the neck warmer it was around uh one degree celsius this morning when i woke up and uh now when i went out the door it was three and uh boy it might it might be four yeah, might be four already by the feel of it thinking of losing this toque already. So I uh, last night I, I pickaxed this a little bit. So, uh, you know, a little bit easy to work with. In that video where I was talking about soil, I really went on and on about uh, horse manure to the extent that I got a lot of questions about People said, what if you don't have horse manure? And I said in the video, that you don't need horse manure to have a good garden. And I, and I alluded to using this technique, but I didn't really go into much detail uh, discussing it. Good God, I gotta, I gotta peel, off, peel off a layer, I'll be right back. So one thing I love about gardening is uh, just the exercise you get. I mean, it's let's say it's four degrees Celsius outside, and all I got on right now is a super thin wool sweater and a t-shirt, a cotton t-shirt, <laughs> and I'm on the verge of overheating, <laughs> and I haven't even done much yet. So anyway, let's uh, move this guy out of the way. Uh, 
I'm sort of I'm not operating on all cylinders today. I broke my uh, one of my toes earlier in the week. Maybe uh, I can't remember what it was now. Three days ago, something like that. Uh, which is funny because I did a video about a month ago telling everybody to be careful and stay safe. <laughs> <laughs> so for those that are curious, what, what happened was that I uh, was getting something out of my garage and I had a crowbar hanging off a hook in there and it wasn't really pr properly hung, I guess, and the crowbar came loose, fell to the ground, and you know a crowbar has one end sort of like a hook and the other end is like a chisel. Oh, the chisel end landed on uh, my right foot on the toe right next to the big toe in such a way that it split the toe in half sort of thing along the toenail uh, and broke the bone at the end of the toe so uh, it was bad enough that I had to go to the emergency room and have them look at it, do x-rays and all that stuff. Which, uh, really not a good, uh, good not, really not, a really, not the best point in time or history to be going to uh, emergency rooms. But, uh, you know, the emergency room trip was surprisingly, uh, usually when you go to an emergency room for something like that, because it's not life-threatening, you might be waiting for hours to get it looked at. But, uh, for me, it, uh, I was in and out, probably in an hour, maybe less, and I got three x-rays and everything. Um, and that's because, because of the social isolation and all the uh, sort of restrictions placed on us right now. Um, all the things people usually do to get injuries, you know, drinking, fighting, uh, <laughs> driving, drinking and driving. <laughs> Right, all those things are greatly reduced, and this is what the doctors told me, right? Like their emergency room incidents are just so far less as all the things people are usually doing to cause these accidents greatly reduced. So uh, all the bars are closed, right? <laughs> and so on. So uh, yeah, it was nowhere near as uh, difficult in a, an ER trip as I, I thought it would be. Oh, good God, it's heavy. Another bucket here. Might need some more buckets. So anyway, I've taken it easy the last couple days and I haven't been shooting as many videos. I really couldn't uh, walk right the first couple days. I was kind of hobbling around and uh, now I'm not so bad, but anyway. In that soil video, I went on and on about horse manure, and I really have not been using horse manure in my garden for quite some time. Uh, just I don't have an easy access to it. The place I used to get it from doesn't have as many horses. So uh, I use this approach, and the soil is now you're watching me doing this and you're saying, well, how you haven't got a lot of rocks in your soil? That's because I pulled all the rocks out last night. <laughs> there was plenty of rocks in here. <laughs> I basically, I probed the whole area with my, with my daughter with a pickaxe and we found most of the rocks and we got them out and we moved them around, moved them elsewhere. So that's why there doesn't seem to be a lot of rocks here. I do have rocky soil. <laughs> Nova Scotia is just a rocky place. Uh, so I imagine the only reason, like a lot of islands, the only reason it wasn't swept into the sea is because it's mostly rocks. So, anyway, so the hoga culture method is just a much better way. For me, this is better than buying soil. I mean, sure, if you're building, if you're building a garden and you're in a hurry and you got a bunch of boxes and you want to fill them with something, uh, you know, uh, probably quicker to buy the soil. But uh, for me, this is 
this is a much better method. Uh, number one, it's very cheap. But number two, darn thing, yeah, you're working with real soil, right? You're working with actual soil that is from where you live. You know, there's a People make the mistake of looking at garden soil that's sold in garden centers. It's so black and they think it's this amazing stuff. And I'm sure in some cases it can be. But you know, often that soil needs to be amended. Like if you're going to buy that stuff, I would work some manure or if you have a source of compost, uh, work the compost into it. And even if you're buying bags of manure at the uh, garden center, I, you know, I have a real look at what you're buying. Because I can tell you from experience, a lot of those bags of manure from garden centers, if you look at it, you know, pick it up and sort of <laughs> feel it with your hands, uh, you'll find out there's a lot of sand in it, right? They're selling you sand. Um, so if you're going to use manure, it's better to get it from a, you know, a farm of some kind if you can, if, if that's nearby. I mean, so this is, for a lot of people, it's just not an option. So I'm just saying... Maybe at the garden center you're going to, there's different bags of manure. Have a look at them. Try to pick the one that's not full of sand. <laughs> so you're buying sand instead of manure. Um, if you're going to buy soil um, and you're going to work manure into it and you're going to use something like cow manure, pig manure, you, you got to work that in. All right, one more bucket here. We're getting, we're getting close to the close to the finish line here, somewhat anyway. I mean, work like this is, uh, this thing has got to go. <laughs> got me crazy. <laughs> uh, all right. Now, work like this is, uh, you know, it's taxing on your body, but for me, I find it keeps me in shape and, you know, it keeps the, what do they call it, the COVID-15 or whatever. <laughs> keeps, that, keeps that at bay. To some extent, but it's rewarding. You really get a a good look at the kind of soil you're dealing with, what it's made of. He's still getting some rocks here. I don't mind these little ones here. I just sort of let them stay. But uh, the larger ones, I take them out because they just make, you know, working it a bit of a challenge. Another good thing you notice when you're digging in the soil like this is how many worms you've got, right? I'm noticing reasonably good worms here. It's not, it's not full of worms. But there's enough to tell me that there's, you know, there have been... Uh, you know, soil organisms, worms and such, uh, working in this garden. If there's worms in your soil, then there's, let's put it another way. If there's worms in your soil, that means there's worm casting, worm poop in your soil, which means there's some stuff in that soil that's going to be really good for your plants. There's one right there, right? So if you're noticing a good number of worms, you probably got reasonably good soil. Now this area here was not, this is the first time this area has really been cultivated. It's had, uh, this area basically would have been uh, a pile of weeds last year. This would have been, yeah, this was outside the garden enclosure and it was not uh, worked or cultivated or anything. It was just weeds. All it was. There's some right there. The grass growing there. Throw that with the weed pile. People have an inclination to uh, to want to go buy soil because they don't they don't think the soil they've got is any good. If there's weeds growing in it and there's worms in it. Uh, Probably halfway is good. 
might be a bit acidic and you know it depends I mean of course it's ideal to get a soil test but I, I never seem to have time for that I, I just stick the plants in and see what happens <laughs> I know that the soil here in Nova Scotia tends to be a bit on the acidic side uh, the things I'm planting here are lingonberries they don't mind slightly acidic soil as far as I understand it so I'm not too worried about it um, I need another bucket so I'll be back in a minute Alright, we're back. Just about got her dug out. Using the wrong foot there. <laughs> That's not going to work out well. So why does this method work? Um, so you, you've got, you know, a bunch of rotten logs in the bottom of the garden, buried, and you've got now, yard waste and weeds and whatever else uh, in with that. And what's going to happen is that you've got different kinds of soil organisms. You know, worms, different sort of microscopic life, uh, fungi, bacteria, a whole range of things. That organic material that you've buried in the bed is a uh, it's gonna, it's gonna rot. It's gonna break down and rot. And the different organisms that live in your soil, as they travel between the soil levels, because some of them do, especially worms, they're gonna bring that material with them and distribute it at the different layers of your soil. So in a sense they're taking the stuff, the rotten, the rotten composted stuff from the bottom and taking it to the top. That's why it works. So it's pretty simple. And I don't know if I'm doing this properly, but you know, there's lots of different videos on how to do this. And people make these giant hills and you know, but for me it, it can be as simple as just having a box, you know, I basically dug down below grade about the, the length of a shovel spade, right? Length of a shovel spade, whatever that is, 10 inches, not much, right? So, I'm lucky I live next to a forest, so there's Rotten logs everywhere. You want the logs to be uh, right on the ground. There's another good rock. Yeah, you want them as, as flat as you can get them. Remember, these logs are doing two things. They're, uh, they're feeding the soil organisms, but they're also holding water for you. So they're simultaneously a, uh, a fertilizer <laughs> and an irrigation system. You can think about it that way. How many things work like that? There's a nice rotten one there. Really didn't, I should have moved a bit more soil. But, oh. I thought I'd do a video like this, just, just working through the whole thing, because you know, often when I have a, a sped up video, and I've edited things out, you know, and I do that because if your videos aren't short, you know, if they're too long, no one watches them. <laughs> and that may be the case with this video. <laughs> but, uh, I know there's some people that sort of want the, 
the extra detail. How rotten should the log be? It should be rotten enough to cut it with a pickaxe. <laughs> right? That's a good, uh, good measure. That's ideal. The more rotten the log is, it's likely the more... Uh, you know, rotten logs require... Uh, logs require... Dead, dead trees, logs... They require nitrogen to break down. So, if, if, it's, if it's already a little bit rotten, then it's already uh, absorbed some nitrogen, right? So, that's, uh, that's why you want, you know, don't go cutting down fresh trees and stuff like that. Use, use the rotten stuff. If you live in a, a neighborhood, it's very, very likely that on, uh, you know, the day of pickup day or guard, you know, yard waste pickup day in your community or municipality or whatever, uh, people throw out rotten logs like this, pieces of dead trees and stuff on their property. So you go around and gather that stuff because it's an excellent uh, gardening resource. Excellent gardening resource. It's basically fertilizer. <laughs> In all the ways that matter. Of course, that doesn't fit. Watch your toe, Greg. There you go. Good enough. All right. Another rock. I missed. That's a good one. Well, not too bad. I guess another follow-up for uh, really regular viewers. That's a good one. For those that saw me put the, the spruce handle on this pickaxe, it's, I've been using it a lot this year and uh, it's held up really well. I mean really well. And I gotta say it's a joy to use a little pickaxe like this. <clears throat> I've been using a full size, you know, heavy duty landscaping pickaxe for years. And I, I saw, this was just like a little short thing that I saw in an army navy store. I guess for building foxholes or some sort of military thing. And I took that home and took that useless little handle off of it and put this full size handle up to my navel. And uh, you know, I'm basically using it for everything I used my big pickaxe before. I'm just not getting completely exhausted in the process. I mean, sure, you can't, you know, you, you can't go as hard at what you're doing and you have to take it easy, especially using a spruce handle, right? But I, you know, maybe it's, maybe this is like an old man's pickaxe, I don't know. But uh, it, it's just an absolute pleasure to use this little thing. Uh, my experience of using pickaxes is just being completely winded and out of breath. I mean, I can think back to when I was 30, I would get winded and out of breath using a pickaxe. Whereas with this, I can sort of just chip away at stuff with this all day long. It's, it's just great. <laughs> I gotta say, I love it. I love this thing. Another friggin' rock. Holy oh, smokes. Got some rocks here. Yeah, it's all granite. And another one. <laughs> there. That's church or something like that. Different kind of rock. I'm not a rock expert. It might not be church, I'm just guessing. I'm sure there's someone. It's it's like a red, red sort of different sort of. Definitely an igneous rock, I think. Yeah. Not a sedimentary rock. All right, so there's that. Now I can put this here. Let's see, we'll get this fit. Get close. Make a little adjustment here. There we go. Little stomp. And one more. You see, all I'm doing is sort of making a floor, right? A soggy, rotten log floor. Uh, is 
enough room here for one more thing. Let's see what we got here. Maybe this. Put her down a bit. If I can split that lengthwise. Doesn't want to go. All right, forget it. Didn't have to work too hard for it. Just a little, a little gap there that I thought uh, needed something. There we go. That'll do. Okay. Little rock there, no big deal. Someone might ask, uh, how do you hold your boxes in place? I mean, <laughs> all I did when I, was, when I was digging this out, so I could put this side down a bit more, like below grade, I just drove a stake in this corner and in that corner, and just kept working, working around the edge with the pickaxe until I got it down until it looked, you know, more level than it was, sort of thing. And then once you get the soil on the inside, and you, you build up the pathway around the outside, you, you, don't, you don't need this thing. <laughs> it just sort of holds itself in place. I mean, sure, you could put pegs down three feet and screw them in and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you could do that, but you don't have to. <laughs> it's the short version. <laughs> no need. Once you get it filled up with dirt and stuff like that, it's, it's not going anywhere. Okay, so now we've done all the hard work, now is the fun part. Uh, so first things first, I'm going to take that container full of like weeds and stuff and dump that in. You don't have to use weeds. I mean, everything I'm doing, there's a thousand different options, right? You don't have to do it exactly the same. But basically, you've got rotten wood and then some sort of compostable organic material on top of it, right? Like that. I could put, I could add leaves or seaweed or something else to this. I'm not going to bother because I didn't dig it that deep. This will be fine. Now I'm going to put this soil in. You'll see when I'm done that the soil level is basically probably halfway up the box. That's what I'm going for anyway as opposed to at the bottom of the box. All right, let's just spread that out a little bit. I don't know where the hell I put my rake. But, uh, get by without it. Chop that stuff up a bit. I think people sometimes get too hung up on having just the right tool or just the right thing. I think we we tend to get uh, covetous or even, you know, we fetishize certain tools. We see someone using a tool. You know, a lot of gardening videos, just like a lot of, you know, outdoor living videos, the purpose of the video isn't to teach you how to do the thing. The purpose of the video is to get you to want the thing that they're using so you'll buy it. I don't want... I'm trying to convince you to not buy soil, right? So yeah, you don't need a special tool. Anything will do. I could do this all with my hands if I really wanted to, especially if, uh, if kneeling was a little bit easier. Right now, kneeling's a bit of a challenge with this friggin' broken toe. All right, that's reasonably good. Now we'll get these guys in there. I can't believe how much soil we got now. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. That is heavy. Actually, I'm going to use the rake for this. I found this rake on the other end of the garden, laying flat, tine side up, 
just waiting to go up and break a nose. <laughs> oh my goodness. Safety is a challenge. <laughs> All right. Spread that out a bit. You can use the back of the rake like a hoe. I really... I grew up watching my uh, uh, father use a hoe in a garden. Breaking up weeds, working hills, hilling potatoes. Uh, I can say as a no-till gardener, I've uh, have never used a hoe. I might use the back of my rake like a hoe sometimes, but uh, that's about it. So it's not good to step on your soil, but I'm just gonna. What I'm doing is I'm working this into the. Uh, I don't want there to be any air spaces um, underneath those logs, so it's good to sort of. You know, do a little bit of a dance, just because you don't want any air pockets below there. All right, when your roots are reaching down into the ground, sure you want air in your soil, but you don't want them reaching in, into an empty space. That's not bad. Plus, if you uh, if you ever have a desire to walk on your soil, this is your. One chance to get it out of your system. <laughs> Unless you're on the sides, it's good to give it a bit of a push. That'll help hold the garden in place. Right? Just almost like you're doing a bit of mortaring. Just a little step all around the sides. Garden won't move. Alright. That's good. Now right, we'll just loosen that up a little bit. We got one more bucket of soil to put on here. Finding a couple of rocks here. It's okay. One, two, three. Yeah. Okay. There we go. We just spread that out. Some reasonably good stuff there. Now this one here I'm going to give a little care because it's the top layer. So it's going to work it with the rake. Remember, this is the only work the soil is ever going to get, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's going to get the berry plants stuck in it. It's going to be mulched. And uh, uh, I'm never going to work this soil again as long as at least in the uh, foreseeable future. So I don't mind spending now, however long this video took, an hour or whatever. Because it's better than driving to the garden center to buy soil. I know this soil will be at least half decent in the first year. And I know every year after that it's going to get better. Because I've got compost underneath it and compost on top of it. Right, the layer of mulch I'm going to add. So I know, <laughs> and maybe based on all the worms I saw, I know that there's plenty, plenty of staff, <laughs> right, to do the work. There, look at that, isn't that beautiful? Every gardener loves to see that. Uh, I have to say, I, I don't miss the hard work of having to till and stuff like that, but I, I do miss the appearance of a a neat looking garden like this. I know there's people that um, mulch with compost instead of mulching with uh, you know uh, leaves and stuff like that like I do. And, uh, people are always saying to me, do you watch Charles Dowding? He mulches with uh, compost. Yeah he does. But uh, you know he runs a market garden and he has a staff and I mean, I, I've watched some of his videos. I've watched enough to know that he's he's sort of in a different situation than me. He's a full-time gardener. I mean, I write books and stuff like that, but I have a full-time job where I work for other people, right? So, and I live in Canada. He lives in England. It's a good deal warmer. I've, I've seen his videos in February, and his February looks like my 
now, <laughs> right, the end of April sort of thing at best. But I mean, the, the main reason I don't do what he does, those that people are always asking that question, is that he's doing hot composting, right? He's taking all his compost materials, he's putting them in composting stations, he's getting the right carbon, uh, carbon nitrogen mix, he's turning them, he's achieving a heat in that uh, compost that kills all the weed seeds. And um, you know he's, uh, you know, and and uh, you know he's doing that. One of the reasons he does that is to prevent, um, at least the argument there is that um, by by mulching with compost he's not getting uh, slugs and snails. And uh, I mean, the, the, a key difference is that he's running a market garden, as far as I understand it. So his produce has to look absolutely flawless, and no one will buy it. Um, whereas uh, I mean, I have slugs and snails in my garden. Um, but uh, and, and my my uh, my greens and various produce, some things get pest damage. Um, but uh, it's just for me. I don't, I'm not trying to sell it to anyone, so it doesn't have to look perfect. Uh, I also find that um, if you have a an abundance of slugs and snails um, over time, if you're living somewhere that has an ecosystem of any kind, um, that uh, over time things show up that eat those things. So. You know, I established this garden in this space in 2013, and I had no slugs or snails the first year. And then uh, every uh, the next couple of years, I got more and more as I got into doing the no-till approach. Um, you know, you're covering everything with the mulch. It's an ideal habitat for slugs and snails. Um, but uh, uh, so that's a bit of a pain. And I've used uh, various kinds of slug baits and stuff like that. I've done videos on that. I'm going to get dive and try it. But I basically use a type of slug bait that I'm comfortable with that, that breaks down, that's um, sort of not toxic to the environment and doesn't persist in the environment. And it's pest specific. It kills slugs and snails. They, they're drawn to it. They eat it. They die uh, because they get an overdose of iron. That's basically the idea. Um, I've got videos on that if you want to search that. I'm not going to talk about it here. Um, but I, find, I found in, in most, like last year in particular, uh, I have less need to use that stuff, uh, less than need to use anything, because I just have more and more insect predators showing up here, solving my problems for me. I've done videos on using uh, BTK for, um, you know, the, the white fly that bothers crucifers, cabbage moths, cabbage worms. There's all these different terms for them. Um, it's a little white, white, well, white butterfly that flies around the garden, lays eggs on your various kinds of greens. And the greens become a perfectly camouflaged, uh, or sorry, the, uh, the eggs become a perfectly camouflaged caterpillar. And there's a bacteria you can spray on your leaves, BTK, that uh, is specific to that caterpillar and kills it. I didn't need to use any of that last year. Uh, I had a lot of wasps flying around the garden and I noticed, so I had um, those butterflies flying around laying eggs, but I also noticed a lot of wasps going around killing the baby caterpillars before they became large. Somehow they can find them. Somehow they can take them at just the right time when maybe they're the juiciest and best tasting, I don't know. Um, so I didn't need to even deal with that problem last year. It just deal, it dealt with itself. That's, that's the whole, one of the ideas behind permaculture, you know, but it, it does take time. It's not immediate, right? And uh, it's a, sort of an evolving type thing. So last year was my best year for pests so far since establishing this, this space. The first year I had none. The second year I had more. The year after that, I had even more. The year after that, I had even more. And then it sort of stayed at that level for a, a couple of years. And that's when I was using, you know, um, different Safer's products. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of <laughs> pesticides for the organic garden, one might call, call those products. Um, and then uh, last year, I noticed it started to go down. So I think I've got, you know, starting to get a balance here in this system of, of pests and things that kill pests. But, Anyway, let's mulch this thing and get her done. Now just before I cover this with the mulch, um, you can see that, you know, I've brought this soil up to actually with it about two inches of the top. I mean, that'll go down a bit with some rain and stuff like that. It'll probably go down another inch, but it's fairly dense soil. I mean, a lot of clay in this, right? Um, but, you know, basically the soil was all the way down at this level and now it's up to here. Um, and that's just because I, I added four inches of logs <laughs> on the ground floor sort of thing. And over time, those logs will become soil. So uh, it's just a great way. It's basically free soil, right? 
a little bit of work involved in it. Uh, but if you if you want to stay in shape, or especially if you've got uh, some teenagers in the house that uh, got nothing to do, <laughs> you put them to work. <laughs> uh, turn your uh, turn some rotten logs into soil. All right, let's fire this mulch on. Here. So I have bags and bags and bags of yard waste that I gather uh, in the fall. And uh, basically almost every every chance I get, although these days you're supposed to be careful about touching things that other people have touched because of COVID-19. But thankfully I I gathered a ridiculous amount of look there's a look some big just I mean this this stuff here's been in a wheelbarrow for days. And uh, look at that. Only fishing season was open. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> right, the worms love this stuff. And if you got worms, you got worm castings, and you either have good soil or you're gonna have good soil. <laughs> right. Looks like we got two different kinds of compost here. This is more of a, a grassy type thing. This other part here is more of a leaf type thing. A weed there. Doesn't matter what you use. The weed. Clump of grass basically. Another one there. If I had that earlier I would have buried it. But... Hey I'm just sort of working through this. This is how I do things normally. I like to get my hands into it and just see what I'm working with. Show me what you're working with. People often ask me about, uh, you know, will that blow away? Well, you know, it's windy where I live, will that blow away? Let me tell you, it's windy where I live. <laughs> right? <laughs> Looking at my roof, there's about... Uh, a dozen shingles missing off of it. <laughs> We're gonna pay someone to put a steel roof on there, I think. I'm just tired of climbing up there to replace shingles. Getting too old for that foolishness. Um, so anyway, this sort of stuff, it just doesn't blow down. This isn't straw. This is, it looks like, it looks like tall grass. It looks like hay, basically, but I mean, it's, it's, it's from someone's leaf bag. So it's basically tall, weedy grass that someone took a weed whack or two raked up and stuck in a bag. Now this stuff, just because of its composition, it, it sort of weaves together and it doesn't go anywhere. And it's an amazing uh, weed suppressant. And people are worried about something like this causing weeds in their garden. You ever mow your lawn and rake up a bunch of the grass and uh, leave it in a pile and forget about it for a couple weeks? Pretty much kills the grass underneath it. <laughs> nothing. The dandelions don't come through that. Nothing comes through that. Uh, you know, eventually that'll break down, maybe by the fall, right? But um, so the clumps of long weed grass, at least where I live, for the most part, I always got to qualify these statements. Uh, excellent at suppressing weeds. Um, leaves, they're a great mulch. They last a long time, and they're really good for holding the moisture in. You know, I won't have to water this garden at all, but they can blow around a little bit. Um, some kinds of leaves blow around more than others. I find. These are from, looks like they're from maybe a maple tree. They tend to pick up the wind and fly around a lot. So often I'll just take a large spruce bough and lay them on top of it to hold them in place. For the most part that works. That sort of approach will totally work here because I'm just going to have like one, two, three, one, two, three, right? Maybe uh, maybe a dozen partridge berries here, something like that. I, I have to look at how big the plant gets. I think I'm getting, uh, I don't know how many I'm getting, maybe six partridge berries and six... Uh, Oh, what are they called? Hascap berries. I don't think that'll, I think that'll be too much to put in this garden altogether. Um, anyway, whatever I've got planted here, it'll be nothing to lay some spruce boughs down to keep this stuff from blowing around. Anyway, 
long rambling video putting together a uh, hogo culture garden on a Friday morning. Uh, just uh, you can hear the birds singing. Yeah, oh, for those that are always following along, uh, the peepers, spring peepers, these little tiny frogs that mate early spring. Usually, for me, that's the true sign of spring and planting time. They started last night here. Last this morning, I got up early, 5 5:30 a.m. And I was down on my computer answering questions from viewers, <laughs> and I can hear the peepers outside. First time, so uh, yeah, it's it's been a cool spring. But you know, late April for peepers here is is relatively normal. <laughs> so uh, you know, that sounds about right. Um, so um, yeah, just for those that are interested. So. Yeah, I hope uh, there was some interesting uh, tidbits there to chew on. I hope that was an interesting video for you. If it was, please like, share, subscribe. Check out my podcast, MaritimeGardening.com. And until next time, get out there, get at it, <laughs> have fun in your garden. Thanks for watching.